In the first part of this series, we looked at the tactics from Canada's colonial playbook. So everyone knew what was going on, including the RCMP, including the churches, and that's why such great efforts were taken to conceal it all. It does take this ground penetrating radar, I think, to communicate that truth to non-Indigenous people. I just really wish that survivors had been believed when they first started to tell those stories. We are not fighting Indigenous kids in court. And yet that next week, uh, we were going to federal court to defend children against the government of Canada. That shows us where we are in this whole colonialism debate, is that the government still feels it can stand up and really lie to Canadians and lie to itself. And now we look at those who are countering the playbook. This is actually the largest modern treaty in Ontario's history. Parliament Hill, the Supreme Court of Canada, they all reside on Algonquin territory. All of them are illegal occupations. This is where the Ryerson statue was. It wasn't just the removal of the statue like in a protest, but it was considered something very community-based. It's putting tools in people's hands. I think these are things that people already have within them. I think we all have that root of rebellion and imagination. It's important not to let go of that land component of their education because of the relationships of reciprocity between um, Indigenous students and non-Indigenous students. What does a world without colonialism look like? How do we even get there? Let's open up the Colonial Toolkit. Drive about two hours west of Ottawa, and you end up in the Algonquins of Pickwaknagon First Nation, or Pick, as it's known to the locals. This seven square kilometer reserve with a population of just over 400 has been at the center of a multi-generational treaty negotiation with Ontario and the federal government. Band member Veldon Coburn has followed the treaty negotiations here closely. We are the only status Algonquin First Nation under the Indian Act federally recognized. There are 10 nationwide, the other nine are in Quebec, but here we are in Ontario and this is where we lived on this particular reserve since the 1860s, uh, but we've lived in this area since time immemorial. The unceded traditional territory of the Algonquin Nation runs across the borders of what is now Ontario and Quebec, including the city of Ottawa. So this is actually the largest modern treaty in Ontario's history. It's for 36,000 square kilometers. Um, and again, if you think about that in terms of what they're going to leave us with, and the number that's on the table right now is 476 square kilometers. That's about 1.3% of the territory that was ours. It's very much just a smattering of random dots of small plots of land throughout this whole sort of eastern Ontario, 36,000 square kilometers. So there are parcels of land as small as two acres. So it's not one very bounded territory that they're going to give us. There are plots of land out in the middle of nowhere where you can't access through road or they're not serviced for public utilities like electricity or you know even water or what have you. We traveled to one of the nearby pieces of land in the proposed treaty. It was a 20 minute drive from Pickwaknagon before we could even see it from the road. So beyond this sort of scene, we see a tree line off in the distance and in there is another plot of land. The five to 10 acres of land in view are surrounded by private property. We also took a road trip to a former piece of land that is no longer part of the treaty negotiation. To our surprise, within minutes of pulling over, we were questioned by what you might call a friendly neighborhood Crown Land Defender. That parcel is no longer part of the treaty. Yeah, and it was a hundred... It remains Crown Land. It remains Crown Land, yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay. And it had us all very concerned. There's a concerned. claim to all of this territory that's unceded, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's, let's, let's leave the path too, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Just get it. We stood our ground on the roadside while curious drivers and others passed by during our interview. The point to be made here is that some of the most desirable Algonquin lands are off the table. We've heard from some sort of landowners association from around here is that these, they have a, 
you know, and there's some wealthy cottage owners here. We're on Mink Lake and that uh, they have a concern about who's going to be living here. Author Lynn Gale is a member of Pikwaknagon and has written extensively about the Algonquin Nation treaty and land claims process. Instead of giving us a lump of land that we can live on and as a community and as a collectivity, they're giving us little pieces, little spots around the territory. It's pretty uh, bizarre. And uh, that's not enough for a nation. And that is not nation to nation, and that is not reconciliation. Pikwaknagon member Greg Sarazen was the former chief negotiator for 10 years for the Algonquin land claim and shares what he believes to be another barrier in the deal. Fee simple land ownership. The problem with the Algonquin Nation holding our lands in fee simple <clears throat> is that it is always subject to being lost by the Algonquin Nation. What we need in, in the, a land claim settlement is a land base recognizes Algonquin and is protected from alienation so that we can never lose it again, so it'll never goes outside of the ownership of the Algonquin Nation as a whole. In other words, fee simple land can be sold, mortgaged or transferred, but also can be lost if taxes or mortgages aren't paid. For band member Mackenzie Commando, a fee simple plan is worrisome. These are some things that my parents have warned me about uh, for years, like we're going to become a municipality, we're going to have to pay taxes on the lands that we've owned for generations and generations. And being from on the reserve and whatnot, like a lot of us, we live in poverty where we don't have like all this money. So what happens when you've had this traditional land that you've had for generations and now you can't pay for it and then it's taken away? Because of these key issues, Pickwaknagon has taken a pause in its treaty negotiations with Ontario and the Crown. There's, there is some mounting frustration at um, recent meetings in the community that we've had several of them in the last couple of months because uh, what's not widely public is we are on, uh, we've suspended our participation in the treaty negotiations. This is the second time. The last time was for almost four years in the early 2000s. There's mounting frustration with the fact that the Crown will not even let us keep those waterways. Um, it's, it, it, it is uh, disheartening, it's heartbreaking for many. Golden Lake, which runs along the reserve, would not be in the hands of the Algonquin Nation as part of the current treaty deal. I don't advocate ever walking away from a negotiation table so much as I advocate in making the negotiation table work for you, for us, the Algonquins of Pekwaknagon. That will take uh, some vision. One of the visions between Ontario and Quebec Algonquins is for the Algonquin Nation to be a federated union within Canada. There would be an Algonquin Nation within Canada the same way that you might have a province. I mean, our territory is larger than um, Prince Edward Island, and it's a province. And it gets to, uh, it has all the sort of constitutional powers, and they govern themselves in that, within that territory. Until then, Pickwaknagon is asking itself a question 30 years in the making. Negotiate or walk away? There's a lot of feel about this land, you know, there's some hurt and there's some love and um, here I feel is home, bottom line, it's home to me. It's orientation week at Toronto's Ryerson University. I'm walking with Professor Pamela Palmiter, heading towards an infamous site on campus. Yeah, we're in the, the heart of the controversy. 
This is Egerton Ryerson. He has his own statue. He has a university named after him. But he also played a pivotal role in a very dark moment in Canadian history. Tonight, the latest in a controversy over on campus over whether this statue should be removed and whether Ryerson should have to change its name. Oh, the stains of pink paint remain across multiple statues downtown. That includes on Ryerson's campus, highlighting the racist history of the school's namesake. This isn't the first time the monument has been defaced as anger grows that the university can continues to recognize a man who was one of the architects of the residential school system. You know, people have been calling for Ryerson to take this statue down for years. In the end, it only took demonstrators a couple of minutes to do exactly that. At the start of the fall term, the university removed the graffiti to comply with City of Toronto bylaws. Palmeter describes what it was like the day the statue came down. Community members and friends and allies and supporters took it upon themselves and they removed the statue. And the really amazing thing about it is, it wasn't just the removal of the statue like in a protest, but it was considered something very community-based because then they started laying little moccasins there and little shoes there to honor the children. And it led to more pressure to change the name of the university. And guess what? They just decided unanimously they're going to change the name of the university. So this action spurred on other action. So it was a good thing. Signs about the renaming process were all over campus. Curiously, though, not mentioning what spurred the name change. Still, Palmetter says that anger transformed into a different kind of energy the day the statue came down. You know, love and anger and sadness and happiness, they're, they're all emotions that work together. And so you had this, this frustration that, not just Ryerson, but universities all over, you know, not taking steps to change their names, not really doing substantive reconciliation. So they removed the statue. This was about love and honor and respect and grief. There were some uh, divisive comments like, go away, colonizer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that's an expression of anger. Yes. And also, what do you think the, the pros and cons are of that kind of message uh, in, in terms of building that allyship and having people consider this in a different way? Is that alienating or is it something that's necessary? I think first and foremost, the primary consideration should always be our people. The, the ones who are the victims of genocide, of ongoing violent colonization, that's both historic and into the present. So that's always my first concern. And anger is a human emotion. It's normal. We all have it. And we're supposed to express it and go through it and let it go through our body so that we don't become sick later on. We've been taught by churches, by parents, by society, you know, repress anger, only show a happy face, but that makes people really sick. And as you know, in our communities, we have a great deal of mental health issues from the traumas, not just the intergenerational trauma, but the ongoing traumas committed by every institution in society, governments and, and organizations. So I think anger is something we should see. As we settle into another part of what is still known as Ryerson University, Palmeter is looking forward to the institution's next phase, including the renaming process. You got an idea for the name? Reconciliation University? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm not sure, you know. It's good I, for the branding because RU is all over the campus. Yeah, exactly. I, I'm uh, pretty certain they'll probably do a consultation process to decide what would be the most appropriate name. Um, is there an individual or something that should be honored? What's going to happen? But yeah, I mean, just knowing that they're in that process of changing the name, I think that's a positive way forward because that's no small feat. When you change a brand for anything, that's no small feat. But you see that happening more and more. Sports teams, universities, street names, everything else. So it's a positive trend. What are you looking at? Real tough guy. Can't even tell you love her. Video games have rarely reflected on colonization. And tabletop games usually cast players as colonizers. There's a metaphor in here somewhere. But there's a new trend in games. Is it one day stuff? Hmm. Onisa Jerdha. 
more and more blockbuster titles are positioning players against colonial forces instead. Why did you enter the sacred mountain without our permission? Or they tell stories based on traditional teachings. And unlike other storytelling methods, games let you choose what happens. We're playing as separate spirits who are protecting our island, along with the native people known as the Dahan, against invaders. And it's that active role. You make the choices. You get to try out different solutions. That's part of what makes non-colonial and indigenous themed and designed games so interesting. They let you grapple with these themes safely, in the comfort of your home, with friends and family, for 40 or $50 off the shelf at a store. And when you buy a game that's created by indigenous artists, that money goes straight to them so that they can make more art and imagine more futures. And best of all, it brings people together. I think that indigenous communities are very closely knit and play is really at the heart of who we are as people. Tamandan is looking forward to the launch of a potentially big game. We're also very excited to be working with a group of indigenous designers in the United States um, that are creating a role-playing game called Coyote and Crow. For me, role-playing games are all about collaborative storytelling. Coyote and Crow is a tabletop role-playing game, a kind of storytelling game where the players make characters who work together to solve problems. William McKay is a Métis writer. He created Chahi, the pan-indigenous trade language used in the game. Our goal is to make sure that everything in Coyote and Crow is letting players tell the stories they want to tell within a world that's indigenous to its core. I just feel like it's putting tools in people's hands. I think these are things that people already have within them. I think we all have that root of rebellion and imagination, um, and we haven't necessarily had the voice for it. Jillian Dolan is a Cree and Métis illustrator working on Coyote and Crow. One of Dolan's pieces for the game is called Motivation. There has to be a reason for why you're going on your quest or your journey. And when I thought about reasons why an Indigenous person would specifically choose to leave their family and their people behind, I thought about relationships, about family, about kinship, and I went from there. Motivation is an example of indigenous futurism, a school of thought that imagines what indigenous life, cultures, and people could look like in both the near and far future. How can we, you know, modify realities? How can we think about the world in a sustainable way? Santo Aviro Ojeda is an indie video game developer who releases storytelling-focused games about indigenous characters and cyberpunk futures on a platform called itch.io. They see the potential for games based on indigenous futurism to bring people together in the real world as well. What I try to aim for with my work whenever I work with anyone else is prioritizing those racialized voices, those indigenous voices, to make sure that marginalized people are fairly compensated and they have meaningful like career experiences and also like they also get to see themselves on screen. If you're a minority who's living with violence through the state or like societally, the only thing you have is to dream. Why are we still here if we're not going to think about something different than how things currently are? Dolan believes there will always be a connection to land. Regardless of anything else, I can't picture a future where we don't continue to have that, that connection. One of the things that we do at the Chinta is we're bringing students out onto the land to live in community, following the Dene laws, um, practicing self-determination in the bush. When I helped uh, found the Chinta, it was an opportunity to kind of um, embody that sort of practice. Are you pushing up or down? 30 kilometers outside of Sambake Yellowknife, Treaty 8 territory, classes in session. So, so how deep spine, do I go? You can feel the spine here and just try to stay right on top of it. This is the Chinta Bush University. And for the last decade, scholars from various nations have been helping students earn credits for on the land learning and written education. My name is Leanne Didasmose Simpson. 
I'm a writer and an academic and a musician. For Leanne Badasmo Sesson Simpson, an instructor at Decinta, it's both a connection to the past and a path forward. How do we build something different? How do we build the kinds of societies and the kinds of families and the kinds of worlds that our ancestors lived in? Because to me, that's such a powerful, powerful tool. We don't have to invent, reinvent the wheel. Um, the, the template is all around me. It's the land. Together with Robin Maynard Simpson is co-author of the forthcoming book, Rehearsals for Living, Conversations on Abolition and Anti-Colonialism. I think definitely Canada has a colonial playbook and it also adapts to changing times and it adapts to uh, indigenous resistance and it adapts to how we are organizing. So when we're thinking about um, building kinds of worlds that we want our great-grandchildren to live in, we have to think long term. We have to work really hard to have good relationships with our own communities across movements because it's not as easy as just sort of um, figuring out the, the four or five tactics that are always used. For instance, um, land claims. Uh, they have been stated um, as a mechanism to do what treaties were originally thought of from Canada's perspective, and that's to extinguish land for the purposes of settlement and economic development. Glenn Coulthard is a member of the Yellow Knives Dene First Nation. He's the author of Red Skin, White Masks, and a co-founder of Duchinta. If we understand uh, colonization as uh, fundamentally being about the separation of people from uh, from land base and the creation of hierarchies based on that, then any decolonized curriculum will have to in include um, a repair of those relationships. Coulthard says the land not only teaches, it heals. Students uh, spend a lot of time um, thinking about these issues while they're while they're scraping hides. We've been taught that you're supposed to talk to the hide and, and the hide almost serves as like a, a a form of therapy or a therapist. Both instructors see land-based education as a foundation for the future. It's important not to let go of that, that uh, land component of their education because of the relationship that, that it, it speaks to us about um, are the same relationships that inform treaty, that inform relationships of reciprocity between um, Indigenous students and non-Indigenous students, white students, uh, black students. Um, so it, it can actually teach us something about, about ordering the world in a, in a non-colonial way. And that um, provides sort of a, a resilience against some of the tactics that um, colonialism uses against us. I mean, in many ways, it's a miracle that I am here today, that we survived. It's uh, a miracle, but it was also very, I think, calculated, strategic resistance on the part of our ancestors and our elders that got us here. And now we inherit that, and we embody that, um, and we practice that with the goal of giving life to those next generations of indigenous, indigenous kids.